Well, hello everybody. Welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about chapter four, which has two main parts, central tendency and variability. And I am going to split these into two separate PowerPoints so you can watch one at one point and one at the other. So we'll start with central tendency. Um, so yep, in this chapter, we'll cover central tendency and measures of variability. This PowerPoint will be on central tendency, which refers to three ways to describe what's happening in the center of a distribution of data. So we're talking about a way that we can describe the average data point, the most typical data point. Um, and that's often a question people ask when you are a researcher. If I'm doing research and I study um, IQ in children with um, stroke, oftentimes children or people, when I say this is my research, they'll say to me, well, what's the average IQ in children who have had a stroke? People are very curious about the average. And there are three ways that we can look at the average, the mean, the median, and the mode. You've probably heard of these before. And so this may be a bit of review, but we're going to talk about why you would use each one, which becomes important in statistics. So as I said, central tendency is a measure that determines one single value that describes the center of your distribution of scores and represents the entire distribution of scores. So what that means, central tendency is a descriptive statistic. We talked about descriptive statistics that they describe your data, they summarize your data, and they organize your data. Uh, frequency distributions, which we talked about in chapter two, were our first descriptive statistic technique. And by that, I, we took our raw data and organized it into a table or a graph. So frequency distributions, frequency tables, are a descriptive te statistical technique that allow us to organize our data. <clears throat> Excuse me. So central tendency is another descriptive statistic um, that summarizes your data because you end up with one number that represents the average of your entire data set. So if you collected, if I collected, let's say, IQ scores on 1,000 children who have had a stroke, I end up with one measure of central tendency, a mean, a median, or a mode, one number that represents the average score. So it's a summary score. Um, and so by identifying this average score, you can summarize or basically condense a large set of data into one value, and therefore we call uh, measures of central tendency a descriptive technique, descriptive statistic. Okay, so the three uh, measures of central tendency, mode, median, and mean. We're going to go through how you compute each one of them. The mode up here um, is the measure of central tendency that gives us the least information. The median gives us a little more, and the mean is the most common measure of central tendency and the one that gives us mo the most information possible. So we'll start with the mode. The mode you've probably calculated before in some other class, it's just simply the most frequent score. So if you have a graph, a frequency distribution graph like a histogram or a frequency polygon that you read about, um, the mode is simply the highest point, the peak on that distribution because that is the most frequently occurring score. As I said, the mode doesn't give you very much information. It just tells you what's the most frequent score. But the reason that it is useful is that it can be used on any scale of measurement, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. And nominal data, if you recall, is when you have your variable is um, people or your observations fall into categories, something like male or female, or if you're looking at eye color, it would be the different eye colors, blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, and you're putting your observations into categories that have no numbers associated with them. Because there are no numbers associated with them, the mode is actually the only measure of central tendency that you can use for nominal data. You can't find the mean, you can't add up these categories and divide, um, it doesn't make any sense. So if you have nominal data, and this is important, 
The only measure of central tendency that you can use is the mode. Um, and there we go. The primary value of the mode is the only measure of central tendency that can be used for nominal data. So to calculate the mode, stats students usually love the mode because it's easy to calculate. All you do is find the most frequent score. So if we have a set of data that looks like this, this is a Beck Depression Inventory um, scores, um, and this is the Beck Depression Inventory, or BDI. That's a commonly used uh, measure of depression where people uh, read a number of symptoms, things like I feel sad, and then circles some of the time, most of the time, all of the time. You add up their scores and you get a, um, an overall BDI score. So in this case, we have seven participants and each participant has a score. Participant one got a two. Participant two received a four on the BDI. Participant three received a three. Um, and these are their um, BDI scores. And if I were to ask you, what is the mode of this data set? Take a look and see if you can figure it out. It's the most frequent score. And in this case, the most frequent score is one and three. We have two modes. The score of one appears twice, five, person five and six both got a one. And a score of three appears twice, person three and person seven also got a three. And so we have actually two modes, or we call that a bimodal distribution. And if you imagine down here we had person eight and they also got a score of three, then what happens to the mode? The mode just becomes three because now we have three scores of three and that would be the most frequent score. Um, because mode is, the mode is basically just the most common score, you can have a unimodal distribution. There's only one mode or there's only one score that's the most common. You could have a bimodal distribution or two modes. That's what we just saw in the slide before, that you have two scores that are the most common. Or you could have a multimodal distribution, meaning there are more than two modes. There might be three modes or four modes or 20 modes if there are 20, let's say, scores that are the most frequent. Okay. Distributions can only have one mean and one median, but they can have many modes. Uh, this is from your textbook, Bimodal Ages of Women Named Violet. And what do we see? We see that um, early in this is so this is the year of birth and over here again is frequency. Um, and so what do we see? We have many violets born in the early 1900s and then a quick drop off of children, uh, girls named Violet. And then a new mode here in 2010 um, and probably still rising that um, there's many, many children named Violet now. So we've got two modes. We've got a mode here, uh, most frequent scores as well as one here. Um, so that is uh, what this is representing. All right, what about the median? The median, if you remember, um, again, might have done this in another class at some point, is simply the middle number. So if you line up your scores in order, and that's key, in order, from smallest to largest, the median is simply the middle number. And the median divides all the scores in your distribution so that 50% of the scores are below the median and 50% are above the median. How to compute the median? Again, it's relatively simple. You place your scores in rank order from smallest to largest and then find the middle number. And because you have to place these numbers on a scale from small to large, you must have numeric data. So they must be, your data have to be at least on an ordinal interval or ratio scale. Cannot find the median of nominal data. Okay. So calculating the median is you line up the scores from smallest to largest and find the middle number. Pretty simple. And again, you may remember from um, doing this in the past that if you have an odd number of scores, it's really easy because there is a middle number and the middle number is your median. If you have an even number of scores, you find the two middle scores Add your two middle scores together and divide by two, 
and that becomes your median. So here we have our same Beck depression inventory scores here for our seven individuals. First thing for median is to median, excuse me, is to reorder them from smallest to largest. So we say, oh, the smallest score is a one, I put it here. We have another one, I put it here. Then we have someone who received a two, that goes here, a three here, a three here, and then we have one four and one five. So these are our reordered uh, BDI scores from smallest to largest. And to find the median, we need to find the middle score. And so there you go, it's a three. It's the, person, the score right in the middle. We've got three scores below and three scores above. So the median is three. All right, very simple to do. The key is to remember to reorder your numbers. I had taught statistics for many years and for many years I give a test question where you need to find the median. And people will, there's always someone who takes the random list of numbers and tells me in this case the median is five. The median is not the middle score in a random list of raw data. The median instead, you must reorder your data and then find the middle score. Okay? And if we had a seven, a eighth data point here, let's say person eight got a six. Now we've got an even number of data points. We have to find the middle two. So in that case, we would have three numbers below, three numbers above, and three and three would be our two middle numbers. And to find the median, you would add these two together, three plus three, which is six, divide by two, which gives you three, the median would be three. Okay. The reason we would use the median instead of the mean is that it is relatively unaffected by extreme scores. And what that means is the median tends to stay in the center of the distribution, Oops, excuse me, if you have, even if you have a very few, um, very high or very low scores. This is when you're talking about a skewed distribution. You remember it's skewed distributions from chapter two. Um, and so if you have, and I'm gonna go back here one slide, if instead of uh, person seven getting a five on the BDI, person seven got a 35. I imagine this is a 35, a very high score, an extreme score. This would make our distribution positively skewed. What happens to the median? And if you look at this, the median doesn't change. The median is still three. And if this person got 135, now an extremely high score, Again, the median doesn't change. So the median is important to use when you have skewed distributions, and I'm gonna show you how that works in an example in a few minutes. Okay, but that's to keep in mind uh, that the median is relatively unaffected by extreme scores, and when you have skewed distributions, you might use the median instead of the mean. So now let's get to the mean, which is the most commonly used measure of central tendency. It's again, something you've all probably done at some point. In order to compute the mean, you must have scores that are on an interval or ratio scale. You might have, must have numbers, and the numbers can't be place value. It can't be ordinal um, numbers, first place, second place, third place. They must be actual real numbers. And how do you find the mean? Again, most of you have done this before. You add up all the scores and divide by the total number of scores. So here's our first formula for the mean. You base, you're you taking the sum of x. x means all your scores. So you're adding up all your scores and dividing by n. n is your total number of scores. Okay, so there's a formula for that. So in this case, if we wanted to find the mean Beck depression inventory, um, here are the same scores we've been using, and it doesn't matter, you could use them in this random order or you could use them in the reordered order, doesn't matter. Add up all the scores and divide by the number of scores. If you want, you could pause this and see if you get the answer right. And if you do, um, you would end up with the sum of scores being 19, divided by seven, and that gives you a mean of 2.71. Okay, this brings us to something that will be very important 
in our class, which are statistical symbols. And in statistics, we have a lot of formulas that we use and therefore a lot of symbols that we use. And in order to understand the symbols, we have to go back to populations and samples. So you remember that a population, this is from chapter one, is everybody you might be interested in studying. So if I'm interested in doing a research study on people with Alzheimer's disease, the population I'm interested in studying is everybody in the world with Alzheimer's disease. Now, of course, that's a huge group of people, and it would be almost impossible for me to test everybody with Alzheimer's disease on whatever it is I'm interested in doing. Maybe it's a new medication. And so instead, I take a sample. And if you recall, a sample is a small group um, of participants taken from the population, and it's that small sample that participates in your research study. So a sample is a small group, um, and the population is everybody we're interested in studying. Now, I'm going to go here. If you are talking about a population um, of data, so if you were somehow able to collect data on an entire population, and this is possible if the population is small. For example, if I'm interested in people, uh, students who are taking my, Dr. Spilkin's uh, 258 class online, then my population would be all of you taking this online class, which is about 40 people. And that could be my population if I have a question of how satisfied are you with the class, or how much are you learning in the class, um, and you are my population, I could probably get data from every single one of you. In that case, I would be able to test the entire population if the population was small. And any uh, numbers, means, or median, or standard deviation, as we'll be talking about, that I get on a population, we call a parameter. Easy to remember because they both start with P, so population, parameter. More commonly, however, I'm studying a sample, which is a small group of individuals, right, taken from the larger population. And if I get a mean for my sample data, or a median, or a standard deviation for my sample data, then that is a statistic. Again, easy to remember because they both start with S. So if you have a sample, you're getting a statistic. This becomes important because uh, the symbols that we use are different if we are talking about a sample or a population. So in this case, we're looking at the mean. The symbol for mean of a sample is either a capital M or an X. And goodness, I'm sorry that the uh, slide looks like this. There should be a line right over the top of the X, and we call that X bar. So the mean can either be sim symbolized for a sample as a capital M or X with a bar over the top. Most times we only have one symbol, um, but for some reason for the mean there are two, a capital M or X bar. And I'm sorry, it didn't come from me, it came from whoever made statistics. Um, so you just have to remember both of those. If you have a mean of a whole population, you are going to symbolize it with this Greek symbol mu. Kind of looks like a droopy U, maybe. Um, but that's the Greek symbol mu. And so if you're talking about the mean of a population, let's say the mean um, satisfaction uh, for the population of students all taking uh, Psych 258 online with me, so that's the 40 of you. Um, if the mean satisfaction score was a four, let's say, I don't know, on a scale of one to five, um, then I would write mu equals four. The population mean equals four. However, if I was looking at a sample, then I would write uh, capital M equals four or X bar equals four. All right. There will be a pattern you'll notice as we go through this class that anytime we're talking about symbols for populations, they are Greek letters. And every time we talk about symbols for samples, they are our regular letters. So that'll be uh, 
pattern that will go throughout the course. So which measure of central tendency is the best? The mean is the most commonly used. It is best for symmetrical distributions, and it gives you the most information. Why do we like the mean? Because if you calculate the mean, remember how you do it, you put every single data point into your computation of the mean, right? You have to add in every single person's score and then divide by the number of scores. Therefore, we think the mean is the most representative of your data set because it has every piece of information um, it is used in the computation. Okay. However, if you have a skewed distribution with one or more outliers, so a very, very high score or a very, very low score, then you would, might uh, use the median instead of the mean. The median is relatively unaffected by outliers, and so you might use the median in this, in this case. And when would you use the mode? Pretty much only when your data are nominal, when you have data that's in categories, and the only thing you can do is count the most frequent score and call it the average score. Okay, so if I was looking at people's uh, eye color in a, in a particular classroom, and I had uh, 12 people with brown eyes and six people with um, blue eyes and two people with green eyes, all I could say is that the modal eye color is brown. It's the most common eye color. And as I said, the mean doesn't work very well um, when you have extreme scores. Because when you have extreme scores, you're going to add those extreme scores into your computation of the mean, and the mean starts to um, be pulled in the direction of the outlier. And again, the mean won't work when you have nominal data because you just can't compute a mean, or ordinal data when you have first place, second place, third place. So although the mean is the measure we prefer, and it's the one that we're going to use 95% of the time, if you've got nominal data, it doesn't work and you need to use the mode. And if you have very skewed data, then again, the mean may not be representative and you might choose the median. Here's something that you could work on and see um, how an outlier affects the mean compared to the median. And let's say I was looking at average um, yearly income for individuals living in San Diego. This is totally made up data, but imagine that's what we did. And we have a sample of 10 participants and we ask them their yearly income. So person one, makes $60,000 a year, person two makes $30,000 a year, person three makes $100,000 a year, and so on. Until we get to lucky person 10 who makes $3 million a year. So what I would like you to do is first try to calculate the median and then calculate the mean. You might want to pause here, give yourself a minute to do that. And then we'll go over the answers. So if you were calculating the median, you would have to first put your uh, income in numerical order. And so you would start with 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 60,000, etc. You have an even number of scores here. So now you would need to find the two middle values. In this case, it's 60,000 and 70,000. You add them together, 60,000 plus 70,000 divided by two, and your median is $65,000. With the mean, however, you add up every single score and divide by your total number of scores, which is 10, and you get a mean income, a uh, yearly income of $354,000. Wow. <laughs> Well, that would be nice if that were the case in San Diego, that the average income was $354,000. Um, it's pretty inaccurate. And what happened is that the mean, because you're adding in every score, including this 3,000, gets pulled quite dramatically towards the outlier. And the mean becomes very high. And so in this case, we would probably choose the median to say the median is the most accurate representation of the average income because it's nine out of 10 people really are in that range. 
um, and the, the uh, median isn't really affected by this 3 million. And in fact, if you now pay attention when there are uh, newspaper reports, sometimes they put out um, the average, homes, average home price in San Diego, um, they will use the median because there are, of course, some extremely, extremely expensive homes. And if you use the mean, then it would make it seem as though, you know, average home price in San Diego is, I don't know, $4 million because you're including some of these $50 million houses that are around. Um, so instead they use the median, which is a better representation. Okay. Lastly, um, shape of the distribution and central tendency. Uh, if you have a symmetrical distribution, then your distribution will have a single mean, median, and mode, and they will all be at the center point of your normal distribution. The highest point will be the mode, the mean, and the median. But in a skewed distribution, there's a pattern of scores that you'll see. I'm going to turn to the next slide so you can see this. Here's a positively skewed distribution where most of our scores are low, but we have a few very high scores. This is like the case of the um, income that we just looked at. Most people have income here, and then we've got our $3 million person way out here. In a positively skewed distribution, the mode is the highest point. The mean is the one that is most pulled toward the outlier, and the median is right in between. And that pattern will always hold up in a positively skewed distribution. And in a negatively skewed distribution, in the case where most people have high scores, but we have a few low scores, again, the mode is always the highest point. The mean will be the one that's most pulled toward that outlier, and the median will be in the middle. All right, I hope that has helped you uh, understand uh, central tendency, and when you're ready, go ahead and start watching the next video about